Hey heroes, and welcome to After Marvel, a brand new podcast where myself, Cap, and Jay, who's off screen, will be talking about Thor, Love and Thunder, and giving us, giving you all our reaction to it. This will be full of spoilers, so if you haven't seen the movie just yet, be sure to go out and watch the movie before we jump into this. So do it now. This is your last chance. Spoilers coming. All right. So Thor, Love and Thunder, absolutely amazing, and I don't understand where people are getting all the hate from it. Oh, I loved it, 100%. Right, like, um, I've seen it twice now, and I felt like I was able to appreciate it more the second time around, and understand it better. Right, I'm seeing it uh, the second time, probably Wednesday or Thursday, but I knew walking out of that theater that it was, I didn't understand where any of that hate was coming from, because it was probably one of the most comedically funny movies Marvel has made and I I couldn't stop laughing throughout the film. Um what funniest part or funniest character for you or mm. characters cuz mine is actually two. You know, shockingly I think the funniest character and it's because of how cringy they were had to be Natalie Portman's Jane Foster Thor, the mighty Th it was just so cringy Eat because my hammer <laughs> everything, everything she said and it was, when I walked out of the theater, it was so funny because all I could imagine was Natalie Portman playing this dude bro that's trying to hit hit off, hit off it off with somebody else they're interested in. Right. And it going so incredibly awkward. It, it was a snare. I right. thought that she was cringily the funny, cringily? That's a word. Yeah, cringe, we'll count it. Cringeworthy character that was just so comedically funny. Right. But... <sighs> And I mean, leaving up to the, the mantle of Thor. Thor obviously has a lot of uh, carry to it, a lot of meaning to it. So trying to like keep her chest out and like, as she, like you could even see like in her walk, like she's trying to be like embrace that Thor. And she was Thor for maybe like two days. Two days. But I have to correct you on that. She's not the mantle of Thor. She's the mighty Thor. Got to get that right. I'll say like the correct. It is the she is the mighty Thor. I don't want her. To oh, absolutely. My ass. I'm just kidding. she is the mighty Thor, but <laughs> still carries the name like Thor in some aspect. Thor is a mantle. Oh, absolutely. It's not a name. And, no, and I was just giving it and hard even to because I thought it was funny because she lady. emphasized that so much within the film. Yes, it worked. So it worked, and it kind of separated because I saw a lot of people show hate towards that and the fact that they're like Thor is a name. I'm like it is a name. But, but it's, it's a mantle, mantle, as seen in the comics, because mm -hmm. the 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 Thor core, um, in some alternate cases in the comics, when Thor mm -hmm. has basically a police force of little different variant Thors, it works out well. And I think that you're right with the mantle. I just wanted to give you some grief on. Thank you for giving me some grief. Her saying the mighty Thor. No, I right. lived for her character. That was she was Natalie Portman. Really sold that movie. Yes. Hats off to Natalie Portman and surprise being a surprise and really embracing that Dr. Jane Foster, the mighty Thor character, so well. But I'm gonna have to say, like, funniest characters for me, the goats. Oh like, god. The goats are a whole nother level. I was like, I was expecting to bring in the goats. Like I was excited, like the goats obviously from not only uh, the comics, but also Norse mythology. Thor has them. That's how he travels. But to give him that comedic aspect that goats scream, goats yell, <laughs> and just to have it throughout the entire movie. Oh, the best part. Because it wasn't just one or two little scenes here, but right. everywhere where they went and <laughs> when they ran into a planet. <laughs> like, every <laughs> aspect. Crash. And I wanted to take it so serious, but it, it's not worth taking. If you have to take it incredibly serious... You take out the fun of the aspect. Right. And those goats just Waititi delivered with them. So that was that was a good that was a good addition too. And I think another good character that we should talk about is a joke character, and that's um Melissa McCarthy's Hella. Okay. That not obviously my favorite. Right. But it was so funny how they introduced Hella almost as this mock character right just like they did in ragnarok and the how loki died play that it was a funny the, the plays are so good so funny so matt, silly. matt damon <laughs> and seeing him out of the costume as kind of nerdy show tune vibe right. matt damon that was that was funny too and the the city hall 
Yeah. And that it's was kind of, funny. It's a nice comedic aspect of thinking about these characters that they've casted to do this play. Um, you've got Matt Damon. You've got um, the guy from Jura- what's the main actor's name from Jurassic Park? He plays Odin. That's so funny because I actually don't like the Jurassic Park movies. So we're I don't have know. to censor that. Do you know how much hate we're going to get for that one? Okay. Um, just going to keep going. You've got uh, Chris Hemsworth's brother, not Liam, but the other one. Yeah. Playing Thor in it. You've got Melissa McCarthy playing Hela. Like, so this little ragtag group of actors, actually big actors in our world. Big actors playing the smallest. Pulling them down. Is, I like that little, there's so much comedy behind this movie. So much. And that's that's why I think when I walked out of the theater, I was just overwhelmed with joy because the, it wasn't it wasn't a stereotypical Marvel movie mm-hmm. where it's a little bit of funny here, a little bit of funny there, and then a dash of all action. Yeah. It was primarily funny here, funny here, a little bit of action, some really good action, mm-hmm. then really funny. They're the really breaking the mold of what we think of Marvel movies, superhero movies in general, really. Uh, if you think about like phase three of Marvel, if you were to put those movies on top of one another and like break it down to like general sense, like what you said, a little bit of funny, a little bit of action, big action, a little bit of funny, it would almost line up perfectly if you think of all the phase three movies. And phase four has really given us that breath of fresh air with like the introduction of series. This movie where it's just been funny, funny, funny. There were times, um, my one, one thing I kind of wish is that I could marinate in some of the feelings that it was giving, like portraying, because Jane Foster having that battle with cancer and then kind of, we get to see the relationship of her and Thor and what happened in that time and why they broke up. Yeah, I really like how they they did that and they introduced it and they showed how much heartbreak it actually caused both of them, but especially mm-hmm. Thor. Yes. Like, it wasn't just another fling for him in his 5,000-year lifespan. It was <laughs> actually somebody he truly was passionate about, mm-hmm. somebody he truly cared about, and ultimately something that drove him to a stage of grief Right. that was like the rest of the Marvel characters untreated right like it's the one relationship that he has in the movies that he lost somebody but because they both went their own ways not because they died like oh my gosh loki his mother his father the warriors i mean lady sif barely has survived she just lost an arm that apparently the arm is in valhalla but she's still what he it likely oh that just gave me a (laughs) <laughs> an image of Sif's arm at Valhalla. <laughs> no, I just see it levitating. Honestly, I, I see it levitating the way Heimdall's son's head Action. floated. Yes. Astrid. Uh, That's the part that you didn't like, was the floating the, head. The only part I did not like, because I, I don't know if I just thought it was corny and if it was cheesy, was Axel's head floating. I love his character. I think that it's a really... This is my thing with Axel. I have a feeling that this is going to be a character we're going to see again in some way as a version of Eindahl in... um, Maybe in Champions, if they do something with that, or if they do... He could be a new addition to Young Avengers. I would say more along the lines of Champions. Champions. I would argue they're less known and less established as Young Avengers in the comics. Champions, correct me if I'm wrong, stationed off the moon, correct? I believe so, yes. Okay, cool. I know less about Champions, more about Young Avengers. Okay, see, I know more about Champions than I do Young Avengers. I know I have a 9-8 in both their first comics. That's... There's there's the flex. There's the flex for the... (laughs) (laughs) I've got them. I I wanted them and I got them. So I think that's a song. I yeah, that's think a song. so, probably. Yeah, I think probably. so. No, that that scene, and I don't know if it was just because I thought it was so animated within it, but like I understand the direction they were going with it. So right. I, I'm not like overly bitter or negative about it. I just thought it was the, the scene that made me 
actually cringe. I if think that makes sense. I understand where you're coming from, but then also to think like maybe Astrid Axel also learning how to use his powers, not understanding like Heimdall obviously not being around, he never showed him how to use his eyes. And so it wasn't until Thor showed him in that brief sense. And that's why the head just was there for that one time. That, that's a good way to look at it. Because, um, you know, we, we never saw Idris Elba's Heimdall play as a floating head. No. So we maybe saw him he in has better control. power. Mm-hmm. And I guess that's a good way to pretend. Because Thor was big on saying, it's okay, I'll teach you how to use your father's powers. Right. And really was adamant about teaching him the ways of it mm-hmm. from some of the scenes that he was involved in i i think they've got it they nailed the actor i think he's going to be fantastic yeah like i do fully believe he'll be a fantastic addition to like, the marvel once universe. again casting on point always, for Mar. always i still to this day i can't really think of anyone that kevin feige has brought in for a role that's been truly bad right sony we're not talking about well, Sony, that's... but... <laughs> they just need to work with Marvel. Like, just get, like, work yeah. more with them. Yeah, they need to agree. Just, Sony needs to work with Feige on everything right. at this point. Because I think that's a whole different discussion. Oh, yeah. That's, that's a discussion that's for the day. day. <laughs> this, is, this, <laughs> this is Thor. This isn't Sony. Um, what's a... Um... What part of the movie that showed really good imagery that you really enjoyed? Your favorite imagery scene, line from the movie? Going from um, I think the ending's fantastic. There, there's mm-hmm. actually a lot of good scenes in it and a right. lot of good imagery. Um, but I think that an aspect that I liked the most was more of an artistic scene. Okay. And it was when they were going into the Shadow Realm with the Bifrost and Stormbreaker. Okay. I thought that the the change over from because when they first introduced the Shadow mm-hmm. Shadow Realm, they it was still colorful. We saw the kids in color. They we were saw black the kids and in color white. They hadn't fully gotten there yet. Yeah, but when the Thors and Tessa or Valkyrie, Valkyrie. and Korg went there with the goats. Um, Cause Just we can't the... leave out the goats. Right. It changed from color to black and white, which I thought was really fascinating. Cause I correct me if I'm wrong. I don't think we've ever seen black and white other than WandaVision. WandaVision has been the only one, but that was because it was the TV styled from the sitcom in yeah. the seventies, sixties. On the big screen, too, this is the first time. If I'm not mistaken, we've seen only black and white. Yeah. And I I just, I thought that that was really cool. I thought that that was a really cool thing to do in the films because we don't see it that often. Even the characters themselves saw, like, like you see them look at themselves and, like, the lack of color that they had. Yeah, lack of pigmentation. They were just Mm -hmm. black and white. They looked like... the Rainbow Bridge was the only thing that had color. And even then, I think it was faint color. I think so. And then um, Mjolnir had had some when Jane would pick it when up. When Jane like lit it. Yes, she mm-hmm. could light it, and it would turn and to would, light blue. It would show her color too in just a small area. Small, yeah. So I kind of like that bringing light into the shadow realm, and it them being able to like do their movie magic to make it where everything's black and white. But if it has light within this radius, we'll have color. And I thought that it was really cool that the entire scene, because we have this preconceived notion that the planets are huge. They're, Mm -hmm. they're not small. Yeah. This is pretty much relatively grounded in scientific theory that Mm -hmm. there's not a lot of small planets. Maybe Pluto, the size is a size of an asteroid could be something you could traverse quickly, maybe. But when you saw it, it was like they were just floating on a boulder. Yeah. And I thought that that was something neat too because i i kind of argue that they're acting larger than life it's yeah because they're trying to prevent something from crashing down Mm -hmm. and burning if that makes sense right that makes so that all together that's probably why that's one of my favorite scenes uh because there's a lot of 
it's up to the viewer what they mm -hmm. interpret. And yeah. that's that's what I saw with that. The, I mean, arguably, you could say for a lot of the movie, it was up to the viewer. Oh, on yeah. What they saw and what they thought and how they would perceive what just happened. I would agree with that. It was very, very good. Like from the trailers, I thought that that moon was the God Bomb from the comic run. And I thought we were actually going to see the God Bomb uh -huh. and we were going to see them explode and that this was going to be Thor taking on the role of All Father and Mighty Thor and then finding a way to introduce Beta Ray Bill to take up the line of Thor and the Thor core. And that was our new Thor. Where, because Chris Hemsworth kind of made a notion saying that he would come back for Thor, but this was his last scheduled movie, which we now know it's Thor will return, <laughs> but they didn't specify which Thor. Correct. Correct. Um, that's actually another really good point because a lot of insiders were heavily speculating on Beta Ray Bill. Yeah. Because they want to introduce him in the third one really bad so I mean, it was kind you've of you've got stormbreaker who beta ray bill is the original wielder of stormbreaker in i think pretty much every universe i don't think there's been one well champions the champions universe which as I we know is this is earth 616 now so technically not even though that's another topic we're getting a lot of I'm topics for I'm going to side to that. Like, <laughs> that's going to be... I kind of agree with Miss Marvel that I don't... Yeah. I... Iman Vellani. Yeah. We, we all agree with her, but unfortunately, Lord Fahey has said this is 616 and what he says goes and all faith mm -hmm. we give to Fahey. I mean... <sighs> he hasn't made a wrong decision yet, no. in my opinion. No. I know some fans are going to be... They're going to give the Eternals argument, and I'm still going to argue with them on Eternals. I will always argue with people on Eternals, but, you know, count me as an oddball, I guess. Yeah. Um. Yeah, no, Beta Ray Bill, that's, that was an interesting topic, because I, I, honestly, after seeing it, normally I pick out what I anticipated to be in there, mm -hmm. and what was actually in there, and for this one, for whatever reason, I didn't do that, because... I don't know if it's because they deviated away from a, certain aspects of the comics, um, especially like spoiler Jane's passing. Yeah, like that was a completely different scene. I personally like both of them. It's not often that I like two different versions of a character's right. death from the comics. I want that pretty much straight away. But um, personally. I like both of her tragic, tragic deaths in comic and movie. I thought I, I can't pick a. Obviously, you don't want to say favorite because that's right. the long term. But I can't pick one you pick, like over the other. Correct. Like a more. I like them both, but this one gets the upper edge. A more admirable. I won't yeah. say respectful or favorite because obviously you don't want to see one of your good characters die or sometimes even your villains right but. that kind of sets us up for like my favorite my wow my favorite scene of imagery before we get there so for those that may not know how she died in the comics do you want to freshen us up with that yeah so it's not going to be super crazy different but she's going to die by being on her deathbed in the hospital with chemo drip going in the arms she pulls it out after she sees um um i believe finreal the wolf chasing down one of the guards and she sees the hammer outside the window levitating mm -hmm. we saw a lot of that in this film we oh, saw yeah. yolnir floating we saw stormbreaker floating. <laughs> we saw a lot of hammer and right. max floating time and basically realizes that there's always got to be a thor and the only way they're going to beat Mangorg is if she takes that mantle again. Mm -hmm. She does whips, if I remember right, a chain around Mjolnir and Mangorg launches it yeah, to the, the sun. The same chains that hold back uh, Fenris, the, the wolf. Yes. Yeah. And launches it at the sun 
which ultimately is the downfall of Jane Foster, Thor, mm-hmm. and goes to the gates of Valhalla. Thor and Odin really aren't happy with this, and they revive her. She comes back, pledges her life to Chemo, and then we see her take up the mantle of Valkyrie. Okay. Now, taking up the Valkyrie, that happens later on when she finds, actually, Valkyrie on the table. You believe, right? Or was it Um, she sees the dead Valkyrie bodies in the morgue? She sees the dead Valkyrie. Valhalla is sealed off and unreachable Mm -hmm. because... There was an event that happened, this is kind of going past what I remember, but there was an event sealed off Valhalla, um, and eventually gets, um, Brunhild sees Jane and asks if she wants to become a Valkyrie, gives her the upgrade, and obviously Jane Foster says yes and becomes Jane Foster Valkyrie. She died in battle, but in the arms of Thor. And And went. She died post battle, but still in battle. Okay, so I don't know. I'll pick up there for my favorite scene of imagery. Um, to start there, my favorite scene of imagery is the end, the very end, where there's so much going on with Gore finally reaching through the um to eternity and making his wish, and how he realized that he's dying. Well, then we get to see that kind of earlier when they were in the Shadow Realm, how he was like, oh, the hammer gives you powers, but does it give you everything? We realize, oh, the Necrosword gave him powers, but the same cost as Jane wielding Mjolnir. That the cosmic uh, weapon that they have ultimately is too strong for their, I'm not going to say Gore is human, but humanoid figures and uh, bodies. So you have the scene of, one, her dying, and not only the, um, the battle between Gore, which is still technically going on because they're just in eternity. The battle's still continuing, even though it's not a fight, but she's still fighting that cancer. Like, she hasn't given up. She hasn't been like, okay, I admit defeat to cancer and things. She wants to keep fighting, not just as Jane, but as Mighty Thor. And then also the scene of the nonverbal between her and Thor when Gore realizes he's dying and he wants to bring back his daughter instead of making the wish to kill all gods that she'll be alone and Jane looks at him says no she won't be and looks right to Thor kind of giving you that nonverbal communication of hey you need to take care of her this is how you're going to keep your heart open and keep it from pushing everyone at arm's length yeah, it's the unspoken moments of love, which right. I thought was absolutely stunning too. Like, the, the movie was just, I loved every bit of it. Right. Once again, it shows us not only um, good scenes of imagery, but even, I mean, how many movies has Thor been in? And in each one, we find another way for him to grow and develop. Like, Thor has so many layers right now. So in many. that this is the fourth movie. He was in four Avengers movies. We've he's been like front row for every Avengers movie that he's been in for the most part, and he keeps growing. He keeps developing. He keeps becoming this. Eventually, we will see All Father Thor. That is end result. Like you cannot tell me that Chris Hemsworth is going to be leaving the MCU at any time. See, with how many layers you were speaking of, I thought you were going with Ogre like Shrek. I'm I almost said like an onion, but I was gonna go yogurt parfait because everyone likes parfaits. Um, but yeah, no, like seriously, like he's got so many layers, and yet again, they find another way to grow and develop Thor into a more like fatherly figure, so to say. Right, and I think that's a smart way to look at it too. Between the uh, that he's becoming more fatherly, but he's not losing that aspect where he knows he's a god. Right. But he almost becomes this triage. He becomes more godly while becoming more fatherly and also becoming more human. Yes. Which gives him a power, I think, that we didn't see with any of the other gods, which is, I think, their greatest downfall. We saw the very first god, can't remember his name, but the parallels between the comics on Gore's first kill. uh, Yeah. the... The golden god. Yeah. Um... 
I the the parallel between the comics on that I loved it, um, but that god in particular lost all touch of reality with any of his followers, disciples. I don't know. I'm not very religious, so I don't know any of these these terms the best to sort of speak. But he lost that aspect to be able to reach his target audience, and as a result. Gore obviously loathed him and wanted him and the rest of the gods dead because that was his first real interaction. Rapu. Rapu. There we go. Perfect. So Rapu losing that ability to connect with his followers just shows how almost justifiably mad Gore was because he lost everything. He lost his... Didn't he say he lost his civilization, but they were still he loyal to him? his empire and that Gore was the last one and that their, the empire had fallen, but the faith had never broke. Right. That they then, continued to pray and worship him until their dying days. And then he just, Rapu just laughed in his face. Completely yeah. laughed in his face. Like, <laughs> I don't care. There will be more servants for me. So, I think that he lost lost that ability to connect with people. And Thor doesn't have that. Right. He had it initially. And in Thor won. We saw his arrogance, his eagerness, his, no, no, I am just, the right, right, I am righteous. I, I'm all, and you all need to worship me. I'm your next king of Asgard. Right. And... I think at the end, which is another important thing to talk, I think another reason Gore decided not to was not only to bring his daughter back, but he saw the three aspects within mm -hmm. Thor and many more and saw maybe they're not all lost. Right. There's and if I wish... The gods. Yeah. Maybe there's hope. Is there? Possibly. Right. I mean, I think that we've seen, seen some aspects. Khonshu and Moon Knight is absolutely... Batwonk goes crazy. Yeah. I won't use explicits. He's I I personally love Kanchu. I think he's crazy. I know I... a lot of people think that he's manipulative. Oh, he, he is. is. He's 100 percent manipulative. 100%. Not denying that. Always will be. And he's a god too. But then we have um oh god, what's her name? The hippo god. Tarawet. Tarawet. She's I wouldn't say she's manipulative. No. I would say she's more humanist humanist and motherly she is the god of fertility nurture and fertility and right motherly protection so so i i think we see some aspects of redeeming qualities within these gods but like hercules showed another aspect of not having anything to be redeeming of and i can't wait to see hercules i wouldn't say there's nothing to be redeemed like we only got a very short snippet of hercules which i'm glad they're bringing him in um, it will make Thor five even more excited. Five, right? There's, I'm telling you, Thor is Thor's not going anywhere. Thor and Hulk will stay around until they die. Which I mean, even in the comics, they grow old. They do. They do. Um. Oh God, Hulk becomes Maestro. Maestro. I'm terrible with names. I forget them all the time. And right. with how many characters and it's only a few. It's only a few. <laughs> And like as many as they're these producing these. Um, and what's funny is I talk about Maestro a lot. I forget his own name, so if that tells you anything, um, yeah, Thor. I think we'll see him and Chris Hemsworth and Tom Hiddleston, if I'm not mistaken, are the only two that are adamantly saying that they would stay and play this character for life if Marvel would allow them. Right. I'm. Almost certain Tom Hiddleston has said it because he loves playing the mantle of Loki. Oh yeah, and I know Chris has said it multiple times because mm -hmm. he he's he loves the the Thor mantle. Yes, yeah. and it's suiting for him. It's very suiting for him. Yeah. So speaking of gods and all of them, let's talk about probably the prettiest aspect of the movie. I'll say is omnipotent city, which I'm. 
Also, kudos to me. I was able to say that the first try. I was nervous. That doesn't happen often. No, it doesn't. Have you been but, practicing? Uh, yes. Oh, not your first time. I'm in the city. <laughs> um, and just showcasing all the gods there, which I thought was really cool. We got to see um, one that was shown but not mentioned. We got to see Bast. Yes. The goddess uh, for um, Black and the, Panther. And the seed right below Thor. and Right below Thor. Right. And all of them. And then we also have to see the, um, not the world serpent, but the dragon-esque head that was kind of like mentioned in uh, uh, Shang-Chi. Yes. Palo, right? Was, was the Palo? It was the land, but the, oh, I saw the name. I can't say it. Serpent God. Who? Oh, man. Kukulkin? Kukulkan? Maybe. But, like, the serpent head there, so it shows a lot of... Um, it looks like they're kind of divided on who it was. Right. So I think asking for mine, it seems like a serpent god who brought winds, rain, and the sun. Um, but no, we got to see a lot of gods in there, and mentions of even gods that they didn't show like the god of carpentry which arguably people say that that could be jesus or so they made jesus mcu canon <laughs> now which is funny to kind of think about um uh, that we're making like things like this mcu canon but i mean look what else have they made mcu alexander the great the oh partition. they did yeah i screamed when that happened on moon knight yeah. I honestly, I was expecting Nefertiti. Like, I was so ready for it to be Nefertiti. Yeah. And then they did Alexander the Great, and I'm like, Curveball. not mad about this. I know. Not mad about this, because this is... So they've taken, like, not only mythology and Marvel comics, but stuff that's happened in real-life history. Right. And made it MCU canon in, like, really fun and interesting ways. Right. I... They are starting to close this gap between any inconsistencies, I think. Mm, I, it That's hard. That's going to be hard to close the gap when you have time travel. Oh, well, that's true. I didn't think about that. But that's a whole nother. Well, no, when you have multiversal travel. Yeah. I take back that statement. Don't judge me. I'm tired. <laughs> I've, I'm functioning on three hours of sleep. Um. But it, like the introduction, you know, wow, introduction of all these gods and different deities, I thought was really cool, very interesting. That was the scene that I like opened up my eyes really wide, and I was like, "Who, who do we got? Who do we got? Come on, show me someone good." Like looking for like an Easter egg, which there could be one in there that I missed, but I didn't see one. Well, and correct me if I'm wrong, but aren't the rumors that Namor is going to be from a Mayan civilization, but Atlantean? uh correct aren't these like the rumor mills which is interesting rumor. because we did see some mayan we saw a lot of mayan uh, representation sir. well there was more than that there was yeah. some in the background mm -hmm. so i think that's an interesting aspect too because that could be another kind of foreshadow into what we could expect possibly um i'm all for namor coming in like i want him to come in that's the original aquaman mm -hmm. i I think that it would be a great addition. We'll see him um, in Wakanda forever. Confirmed. It is confirmed? It is confirmed. Okay. Because That's I the got... only thing we know about the movie. And we probably won't know anything until the next 90 days. Until Three. 90 days before the movie comes out. 90 days before out. the movie comes out, right? Because that's when Love and Thunder released its first trailer, if I'm not yeah. mistaken. It was like exactly 90. And it worked out beautifully for them. It was a good marketing ploy. It like, was, it was good. And, and I... they, brand... they advertised so much on TikTok... And I'll say, up until, like, the week before with their TV spots, they didn't really give us a whole lot. No, they didn't. The way they cut it and everything, like, when he throws down his sword and then that lightning comes out, we saw those were two different scenes. When he throws down his sword, shadow monsters come out. That lightning was Thor bringing the, or calling uh, Stormbreaker back to him. Right. I was like, that is neat. I was like, because, like, bringing down the sword, lightning coming out, I was like, God bomb. That's what made me think of that. That's smart. That's a smart conclusion. To yeah. Think of. I'll so say the with the trailers, 
there were less issues with the trailers this time where I could see them going any way. Where, like, yes. the trailers for No Way Home, I obviously... The one in particular where it's yeah. like, oh, it's clear we're getting it's... the other two, but they're just fully hiding it. Um, This one I didn't see as many questionable aspects. Like, mm -hmm. they could be doing this, they could be doing that. Yeah, yeah, they did very good marketing. They um, did. So with the gods and then the introduction of Valhalla. Now, we've been talking about this movie all day. This is the one aspect that I didn't talk about because it's something interesting. This not only includes Thor, Love and Thunder, but the entire phase four. We've gotten Valhalla now. But what else have we got? We've gotten ancestral planes acknowledged from other spiritual dimensions. We've gotten the Duat. We've gotten speaks of like realms and the underworld and all these different spiritual planes. Could this be like a... And we have our first cosmic being that's going to be sticking around for a while oh, in yeah. love. Um, what do you think this means for Phase 4? As it starts to seem that Phase 4 is very spirit-based. We even have the, um, the Nord Dimension, which... Is um not like Valhalla and stuff like that, but it's another dimension that seems to be where Kamala is connected to. Well, and I think another thing that you're kind of missing, um, which isn't really the same because it's only going to affect two major characters in a way, is the Soul Gem, the inside of the Soul Gem. Yeah. Where I would argue we have Natasha locked Tony. away, and then it probably has Tony. The yes. And then it could potentially have the original Gamora. But that could be argued a timeline that she's not have, really in there. Oh, that's right. Time is fun. I would say that's a grandfather paradox. Yeah. Where you, you just... Paradox. We'll paradox it where Gamora's probably not in it because she's still technically alive, but she wasn't. She was unalived. Mm -hmm. I don't know. That's, but I would say that's another plan that we would look at. A plane to look at because we're getting into this realm of afterlife. I suppose the soul gem would count too. That's sort of I a plane. Would, it, it doesn't seem like you can come back from the soul gem. I don't think, no. Where but we've I mean, seen that you can go back and forth with the ancestral plane. You can go back and forth with the duat and the field of reeds and the sands. You Valhalla. can. Valhalla. Seems like, would you say it's possible to go back and forth? Do we get a reiteration of the mighty Thor in her Valkyrie form? I want to say yes. I want, okay, so this is what I want. Because we have sort of talked about it the after premiere night. Mm -hmm. In Valhalla, the one thing I want, which is something that people might not care about, is the actual Odin and getting anthony hopkins back but he loathes the idea of sequels like it apparently from some of the insiders he did not want to come back for thor 2 he only did it by contract and it was like begrudgingly hard to get him to come back on hmm. thor 3 but i want to see him again and it kind of makes sense that if he's in valhalla we should realistically see odin again at least passing that mantle officially to thor like, Thor could see him once more, and that could be the final iteration of Odin, as he's fully giving mm -hmm. him. We would never see him again on screen. I I don't know if any of this is making sense. Right. But I think that it would be, if we're going to see Thor all father, I think it would be logical that we would see Odin giving that mantle. But I guess, honestly, Odin didn't really die in battle. And I don't know, rock old. Mm hmm Unless they say, I, you could honestly argue anything. Because I guess he was technically battling Hela every single day to keep her locked away. I mean, you can <laughs> always, like, You can argue aware. everything. You can manipulate anything. Because as soon as he died, that's when she broke free. Yeah. So you can, you could say that, that he's been battling Hela her the whole time. And his 
greatest weapon was his ability locker away, his magical abilities. I don't know, but, but I would you, like to see that. Would you say it was a battle if maybe she was just waiting? Maybe she wasn't fighting? I find it hard to believe that. Well, here's the fun fact, because Hela did die in battle. She was battling... God damn it, the name escaped me. In Ragnarok? Yeah. Oh, Surtur? Yeah, Surtur. She she was battling him at the end, and she died. She's not well, going to Valhalla. Who knows how these things work? You you have to die an honorable warrior's death to get She tried Valhalla. to save Asgard. Look, I just want Kate Blanchett back. I'm just going to do everything I can to desire to get Kate Blanchett back. When they go, when they go to hell and they finally introduce Mephisto, we are the, never going to get Mephisto. I am on this wagon. We're getting him. Oh, I, I thought we were getting him for the longest time. I want Mephisto. Don't get me wrong. I want Mephisto. It makes sense. I think once we get Mephisto, I easily get Wiccan, and I get the rest of the Young Avengers yep. fully teamed up because we need Mephisto. Mm -hmm. We're not going to get Mephisto. So there are you... too many societies that would blockade any showing of that because he is a demon. That's fine. I'm totally okay if they block it in their country. I don't care. I was going to see it myself. Like, give me Mephisto. But we're not going to see it. I think there's chance. No. We've seen the Duat. We've seen uh, Valhalla. We've seen Ancestral Planes. We've seen multiple afterlifes. We need the other iteration of afterlife. I, I want they could they could do it they can do it with they've done it with like Ghost Rider I don't uh, I mean despite what you say about that movie they brought him in in a way I if we get Ghost Rider which I think is very possible with Midnight, Midnight Suns, Suns if we get we would get Ghost Rider well before we got Mephisto well, in yeah, my I, personal opinion. Um, and then once we get that, then maybe, actually, that'd be a pretty cool tie-in, Fisto with Ghost Rider. Mm -hmm. That's promising. Yeah. That's promising. Yeah, yeah, yeah. See? But. Uh -huh. Hop on the bandwagon. I still don't think. I think that it's a pipe dream at the current moment. Okay. And I'm going to uh, begrudgingly say that it's a pipe dream. I don't want it to be. Trust me. I'm on the bandwagon. Give me Mephisto. <laughs> but. You're in the more realistic to be fair, bandwagon. To be fair, one of my favorite comic lines is Young Avengers. I grew up with it. I loved it as a kid. I still love it today. Mm -hmm. It's kind of what got me into comics. Um, no matter what anybody says about them. And I didn't think that they would ever make the screen because they're too new. Doesn't make sense. Right. And why would they introduce the Young Avengers? So maybe, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe they will introduce Mephisto. I thought we were going to get him in WandaVision. Then I thought we were going to get him in Doctor Strange. So I've just built up this, I'm not getting my hopes up because I don't want to be devastated. There's been some times we could have gotten him. Yes. We basically got a glimpse in MOM at the end where Wanda was getting pushed into a hell realm, wherever that was, because I don't think they ever declared what that was. She's getting pushed into the hell realm? Remember when American Chavez opened the portal oh. and she was starting to fall off the cliff? Yeah. Yeah, I, that looked, that, into it. Okay, that looked okay, okay. pretty hellish. I yeah. could be wrong. Depends on the duration of hell, I guess. That could be what is. There we go. Could get my Kate Blanchett. Man. See? You need this. Love her. Um, so Thor, it ends. We kind of mm -hmm. see um, him and Love, uh, their little dynamic. She gets to wield Stormbreaker, which, side tangent, how many people wielded Stormbreaker? In this movie, I think everybody can. Like, I think everybody's worthy enough to do movie. Apparently, <laughs> not only Mjolnir right there. is the one that can. <laughs> you have to be worthy to pick up anyone can wield Stormbreaker. It seems anybody because Gore but, was carrying it, Love was carrying it. You know who didn't carry Stormbreaker? Who? Beta Ray Bill. God damn! <laughs> All right, ouch. So we see them out heading <laughs> towards the beach. He has uh, a new razzle dazzled. Uh, Milner in hand and love <laughs> with the giant Stormbreaker that's as tall as she is, wielding it just one handed, ready to go as they go into battle. What is this set up for Thor 5? 
the rest of phase four into phase five because I don't think we're going to be getting another Thor movie anytime soon. No, I'm betting we're going to see Thor if when the time comes we get Thor five because I think it is inevitable. Mm-hmm. I think that's going to be a phase six or a very very oh, penultimate God, phase five or a series. We could get a Disney Plus series because they just don't want to push another. They movie. won't get a no. Thor will get a movie. I hope so. Thor will do enough money to where it would not make any sense to do a series. I mean, obviously, that that's the right answer. Yeah. But, I mean, you never know what could happen again. Do we see Dr. Jane Foster alive in Thor 5? I hope so. I hope we see her back. You want her as the Valkyrie form? Yes. Okay. Yes, I want her in Valkyrie. Wielding the all-weapon? Under your arm? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I think... I think going into Love and Thunder, I did not want that because I was skeptical on Natalie Portman. I yeah. love her as an actress. I think she's great. But when you look at Jane Foster's past performances and Thor, she was okay. When she was in the dark world, you could tell she was miserable. She didn't, she didn't seem very happy on Dark World. She obviously didn't come back for Ragnarok. Um, I know that there were some criticisms she had with one of the directors and it did not work out well. She said she would never work with Marvel again, yet here she is. But Uh, Taika reached out to her for this one. Which is smart. And they, however they talk to each other, it worked. So I think if we get Thor 5, Waititi needs to do it. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't think they should steer away from that. Um, because I think they would put it into almost an identity crisis now. Because I think it would put it in the realm of what Guardians of the Galaxy 3 would have been without James Gunn. Like, can you think about the nightmare that scene would have been? No. And Disney was... I'm not going to say Feige was pushing for that. Disney was more pushing to get James Gunn out because of some controversial tweet he yeah. made. That he since rescinded a long time ago. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think that Thor 5 without Waititi would have an identity crisis. Right. That's my hot take on that. Mm-hmm. So what do I think we would see? I think that we would see Dr. Jane Foster back. Okay. I think we would see her as a Valkyrie. Mm-hmm. So I think that's the smart way to go with this at this yeah. point. Uh, and it would, I'm assuming we would see more of the Valkyrie again. Yeah. Like, we would set that up. Uh, one thing I'm really shocked about is that Tessa Thompson's Valkyrie didn't die. Halfway through the movie, it didn't. I didn't think she was going to die. Um, this is a side tangent. I know mm-hmm. we're not supposed to be going on this right now. <laughs> supposed to stick on timetables. I'm not good at that. I stopped taking my ADHD medicine years ago. <laughs> Um, but halfway through, and when they got to hmm, the Shadow Realm, when they got mm-hmm. on that little rock of a planet, right. something just told me inside, oh, Tessa Thompson's Valkyrie, this is when she's gonna die. And I was wrong. Happily. Yeah. I'm happy I was wrong, because I love Tessa Thompson. I think she does a fantastic job. I think if they do kill her off, it won't be until after they acknowledge Jane Foster as Valkyrie, Valkyrie. Jane Foster. I agree. I agree. So with um, her staying around as Valkyrie, what about Love? Our first real... We've seen the Watcher, obviously a cosmic being. We've got n- nods to the Living Tribunal, the three heads, the cosmic being that oversees everything, the highest form of judgment in the entire multiverse. And now we've got Love, who, a cosmic being that is on Earth, running around with Stormbreaker (laughs) and Thor. What does the future hold for her? And what does this mean for the next big bad that we have to have a cosmic being involved in it? That's a good question. Honestly, I have no idea. This is one of the only aspects I'm not too entirely sure where we're gonna go from here right what i can say is i really hope that um marvel moves forward and keeps chris hemsworth's daughter because i think that's a great 
great, great addition. Yes. It's a fun little uh, dynamic that I wasn't expecting. I didn't expect it at all. Um, I, yeah. Because okay, she's not really in the comic besides just being a cosmic no. being. And so this is That's... pretty much an original character that once again they are giving us. That's why I'm like, I really have no idea what we're going to see from this. So it'll be interesting, this... yeah, <clears throat> to have somebody that, as far as we know, she's worthy enough to wield Stormbreaker. She's mm -hmm. got potentially the powers of Thor with that and the lightning. Um, she can shoot purple beams out of her eyes and has a bit of a temper as she tells her dad to go to hell, you demon. <laughs> Which... Well, and it's really interesting, too, because out of all the forms of magic we've seen. We've only seen purple as a stone. Mm -hmm. We've only seen purple for Ag Agatha Harkness. So if we're trying to connect all these... Clea. Oh yeah, Cleo was introduced. The dark dimension. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so she's purple too. Yeah. Mid-credit scene. Mm -hmm. I'm excited for Clea. Yeah. So with her having purple abilities... It kind of points us to maybe Kang really is the next big bad. Is that's something I'm telling you, Kang's going gonna be the next big. You and I have bits of feud on this one every yes. so often. I I see it Kang now. Is a big villain. I see it now more. Kang is huge. <clears throat> Kang is big. Like they'd be a good villain to bring in. Because you were thinking it was gonna be Doctor Doom yeah, and Doom, Doom. Huh? Doom was my one. Yeah. And I was arguing, no, I think that that's after. So my thing with Doom, side tangent away from Thor, I think we will see Doom soon-ish entered. I mean, we've got Star Wars. I, I, I think the Howard Stern thing is a ploy. I think Kevin I think Feige that's would, just going to be a podcast. Yeah, I think Feige would be having a fate and payday yeah. right now with him right now, and it would be pretty much lambasted everywhere. This is not true. Yeah. Because he would do everything to cover that up. The, just like he did with No Way Home. They did everything in their power to get Andrew Garfield to convincingly lie that he wasn't in No Way Home. Mm -hmm. So I think he would be doing the same thing with this. I don't see that. I don't see him being a big part <clears throat> no. of Doom or any kind of iteration of Doom. Mm -hmm. But I still see that it could be Doom. I mean, we're getting Secret War. You can't have Secret War without... Doom, just like you can't well, have Civil War without Spider-Man. I think we are getting Secret War, and I think what's going to come before Secret War, War is a Scarlet Witch movie, and yeah. I think it is going to be Children's Crusade. Okay. So I think we're going to set up Young Avengers um, early on, and then they'll move to a Scarlet Witch movie. Okay. And I, I do fully believe Multiverse of Madness sets that up. As soon as I, as soon as I walked out of MOM, mm -hmm. the first thing I thought is, oh... That's how they're setting up Children's Crusade. Doom's gonna find her up there on Mundegard. Mm -hmm. I can never pronounce it. Yeah. I don't practice like you. Yeah, no. I just, I just... I'm a first-timer. Yeah. I can see it. I can read it. Can't say it out loud. <laughs> exactly. It's Mundo something. You had it really yeah. close the first time, so we'll just count that. Yeah, you know, um, that's fine. I try my best. Right. I'm not perfect. <clears throat> riddled in flaws um and i think that that's where they're gonna go with that and that's how we're going to get if i had my way um that's how we would get dr doom okay and then we would branch from children's crusade into fantastic four that's not gonna happen we're gonna get a fantastic four first oh yeah it's probably gonna set up dr doom um I just hope that it's completely different from the other two incarnations we have with the Fantastic Four. I have my own theories about that. I'll save for another day. I don't think. I would rather have Galactus entered into Fantastic Four or the Scrolls. But the Secret way invasion. the I mean, way MCU is going, the Scrolls aren't the villains, which I like. I like that change. I like seeing the greediness, the bad guys. We're um, getting a lot of pretech as of late. Yeah, we are. We are. 
um, which I like. It makes me wonder why we're not seeing like Hulkling already, which I think is um, Secret Invasion. I think all hands on deck. We're going to see Hulkling in that. Um, I'm big on speculation. Mm -hmm. Big on speculation. So anyway, back to Thor Love and Thunder because I can't keep a topic for more than five seconds. Right. Yeah, no, not today. Doing great on this. (laughs) But yeah, it really sets up for just about anything, and it's very opposite of Ragnarok, where Ragnarok burned everything down. Oh, yeah. And Taika built up a different picture for us for the future of Thor. This one, like I like you, after premiere night, you enjoyed the movie so much, and I was more so, I'm more excited about what's, what's next. to come. And like, because this built up so much, it was so much world built like universe building not just world building universe and realm building in this uh movie which arguably phase four has been doing a crap ton of world universe and realm building where we're not just on earth anymore or in space we're in realms we're in afterlives we're in all these different areas and universes it's crazy it is crazy it's it's shocking still how big the MCU is and the only character that they're recasting but not really recasting they're passing the mantle on to is Captain America for obvious reasons. Yeah. And I say that not to be shady or anything, but how many Batmans have we seen in the past 20 years? I mean, true. How many? And Marvel hasn't done that. No, we haven't been seen... Zero re- well... The only Hulk recast, yep, is go. really the only one. But that's kind of questionable because because the reason nothing part of Incredible Hulk has really been canonized. No, and they won't because if I'm not mistaken, I think Hulk is still under the rights of Universal. Uh yes, that's why he doesn't get his own movie. Yeah, but he's getting She Hulk, and then there is rumors and speculation on World War Hulk at some point down the road. As soon as all that yeah because i think universal's up. contract is set to expire in 2024 if i'm not yes. mistaken if if i if memory serves me right mm-hmm. and obviously universal's not going to make a movie from it no. they don't have that authority that's like netflix trying to pursue their series still they yeah. they can't do that they would get shut down so it's only a matter of time we're going to see it and i think we will see world war hulk yeah which i'm kind of excited about i'm very excited it. for because i think they can do that very well 100 uh, percent, and um mark ruffalo is a great hulk so i i think at least i know yeah. some people are a little bit not great with him but he's, i think he's good because we've seen three hulks three mm-hmm. different hulk actors i feel like each one kind of brought in a different aspect of bruce banner they did i think ruffalo brings the intelligent and the more, more intelligent mm-hmm. um Edward Norton brought brutality, yeah, and aggression. I'll say the first one brought brutality and aggression. I don't remember the actors. Yeah, name, so sorry. Edward Norton brought more control or trying to control the beast. Yeah, that's a good assessment. With like the breathing, we see him meditating. We see him trying to find that balance between the two. But when he didn't have control, it was full on aggression. Oh, it was full, Hulk. full aggression, full Hulk. Yeah. So. I have mixed things. But I mean that's not canon, so it doesn't matter. Yeah. So and the question of what comes next, I mean, I think we're gonna see that in a couple weeks on the panel. But phase four is the only one that I struggle to see exactly where things are going to go and I from love here. That. I do too. I do too, to an extent. Um There's just so much they can do. So much they can do. And I think... And the series are making it even wider. Mm -hmm. The question is, are we getting too much, or are we getting just enough? Not enough. Not enough? Yeah. I'll never get enough of this stuff. See, I think we're at the... I think we're at the right amount. Yeah. I think we're at the right amount. And I think... I'm not one to complain about the CGI. I think it looks fine. Um, and they obviously fine-tune it all the way up. They were working on Multiverse of Madness 
through like week two of it being in the theater. Yes. Like they were still making edits and then sending them out, which I think is fine. But I, I wish that if they were behind, they would just say, we're going to push it back one or two weeks. I know that that's not great for fan service, mm-hmm. but I would rather. It's hard to push it back when you've already been advertising it. As right. Much yet. It is. But like within a 90 day, if we're not going to see the trailers for 90 mm-hmm. days, by that 90 day, before you release the trailer, I would say just verify right, and see where it is. And if it says, hey, you know, maybe we need 100 days or 120 days, mm-hmm. just extend it. I would rather have that wait an extra 30 so I don't have to hear people complain about CGI anymore. If I have to hear somebody else complain about CGI, it. it's exhausting. It's taxing. It is what it is. But it is what it is. Thor Love and Thunder really sets it up for an exciting future, a new world building I'm very excited for it, Same. and I think that's a good place to kind of call it for this before we... Because we could probably do this all day. Probably. Just like Cap. Um, kinda, I had to resist. Um, but thank you everyone for joining in for After Marvel, uh, our little podcast that we do, talking about all the shows and movies. Uh, next week, if you're down, uh, I'm down. I'm in Pittsburgh. Okay, well then so... it'll be at least me. Uh, we'll see somebody. Um, but we'll be breaking down, uh, episode six of Miss Marvel. Oh, I need to watch that. Yeah. Yeah. You, yeah you're behind an episode. Which, I'm one episode behind. Yeah. Been busy. So. Yeah. So next Monday we'll be breaking down Miss Marvel. So stay tuned for that. Um, but thank you for tuning in to our very first after Marvel. We'll see you in the next one. And as always stay amazing. Bye-bye.